Hello, Peter. Hello, everyone. Namaste. Greetings, Ampa. How are you? You're okay? Very well, Ampa. All right, good. Please allow us to pay respects as you are enter the room. Please do. <clears throat> So, Bita, we could begin with the Itipi So three times, everyone, if you'd like to join, if you get that up on the screen. So, please join us. Itipi So Bhagavara Sama Sam. Thank you. 
meditation maybe what beats about half an hour is that the usual yeah okay that we shall do so uh using bodily sensations is something which is very common in buddhist practice so I'll describe that meditation. Most of you know it. Um, and it's a, it's a brilliant way to, to let go of the sort of self-identity with the body and come to a sense of um, reality rather than the papancha of ego thought. Because when you, when you can know the, the actual sensation of your hands, that when I feel my hands, that's not a concept. It's a real experience, sensation. And if you can stay with those real sensations, then that's a very calming way of entering into the present moment. And then from that, you can then see that sensations change and you can ask that profound question, what is unchanging? And you, you get a sense that the, the Dharma is awareness. Awareness knows. And there's something in conscious, as consciousness, as awareness, whatever you want to call it, is unchanging. And referencing that is the, the pathway to the transcendent. So by knowing something which is changing, and anicca dukkha anatta, knowing it, knowing it, knowing it through meditation, you begin to, to be curious about the knowing itself. And then that is where you find your, your most profound peace liberation so let's so I'll describe it for a little bit and then we'll sit quietly so whatever posture you're in now try to establish it so you're not fidgety you know that that's nice and solid balanced and they can hold it for a period of time without having to itch or scratch or do something so physical stillness is helpful, but, but not in this kind of military way, just in a relaxed, attentive, present way. So know your posture, know the body. Let 
listen to sound. Notice that sound is an objective experience in awareness. And then feel your body. And notice that that is an objective experience in awareness. Two experiences, sound, body sensation. Bring attention to your mouth, the whole area around the mouth, go inside the mouth, feel inside the left cheek, and then let whatever sensation is there, let it just become conscious. So there's an attitude of waiting, witnessing, and if there's no sensation, the waiting and witnessing is the same. So you're not trying to produce an experience or get an experience. Feel the right side inside the cheek, inside the mouth. Feel the upper palate. Feel the lower palate. Feel the teeth, the lips, and then feel the tongue. Now bring all that together as one mass of sensations. So this isn't about thought. This is direct experience of the sensations of the body. Begin to just notice the still, the still knowing of bodily sensations. So move from the mouth to the inside of the ears, the ear canals, both ear canals. Let that become conscious. Feel the outer architecture of the ears. And this is in awareness. Feel it as sensation, vibration, radiation. Feel your nose. The bridge of the nose the nostrils. Now don't squeeze your eyes, try to see your nose, just let whatever sensations are there become conscious. You're waiting, witnessing. Feel your eyes, the eye sockets. and the eyes themselves as vibration, radiating energy. Go behind the eyes, draw a line inside, inside the skull. See if you can feel the brain. Or whatever you feel there, let that become conscious. So this isn't uh, an anatomical exercise. It's just being present to bodily sensation. and not trying to figure out the anatomy of the body. It's very simple. So move away from thought. Feel the scalp, go to the top of the head. Feel the scalp, inside the scalp, 
inside the skull. Let that be conscious as radiation, vibration to the back, back of the head. Now feel the whole head as sensation radiating outwards. Let that be conscious. And there's the silent note, the silent witness. Feel the back of your neck. Feel the sides of the neck. Feel the throat. The whole neck area as a mass of sensations. No thought, just sensation. Connecting to the shoulders, left side of the neck, connecting to the left shoulder. Feel the sensation. And then down the left arm, the left armpit, outer arm. The left elbow, forearm. Wrist and thumb, index finger, middle finger, ring finger, and small finger. Feel the palm of the hand. Feel the whole hand, and the whole left arm, and shoulder. Bring it all together as a mass of sensation. Feel the right side of the neck connecting to the right shoulder. Then down the right arm, the right armpit the outer arm, upper arm, right elbow, forearm, right wrist, right thumb, forefinger, middle finger, ring finger, small finger, the palm of the right hand, Feel the whole right hand, the whole right arm and shoulder. Bring it together as one mass of sensations. Both arms, both shoulders, neck and the head. Radiating sensations in awareness, objects in awareness. From your throat, go into the chest, inside the chest. Feel inside the left wall of the chest, inside the right wall. the breastplate and the upper spine. Feel the lungs and the heart. And bring that whole area together as one mass of sensations radiating. The abdominal area 
Feel the front wall of their abdomen inside the abdomen. Inside the left wall. Inside the right wall. And the lower spine. And then all the organs, stomach, intestine, liver, kidneys. Again, you might not notice them specifically, but just whatever manifests there in awareness. So we're not looking for something, but we're aware of what is. Feel the pelvic area, the sides of the pelvic bones, the weight of the body on your cushion or the chair, and feel the organs in the pelvic area as sensation or mass of sensation radiating. Feel both hips, both thighs, both knees, lower legs, ankles, feet, feet, all the way up to the hips, both legs as one mass of sensation. And bring all that together, the torso, the arms, the neck and the head. Now the body as sensation radiating. And this is in awareness. Not a thought, this isn't the thought about the body. Listen to sound. Sound is in awareness. Bodily sensations in awareness. And so now be that awareness, knowing change, different sounds, different bodily feelings arising and ceasing, and now you're the silent witness, accepting all things and letting go of all things. Open to everything, but not holding on to anything. So see if you can just do that simple knowing awareness with the way things are.
How is everyone doing? Okay. COVID free. Shenzhen, you want to start? Good evening, Lompo. Hello. Yes, Lompo. Brahma Janoka Dipati Sahampati Katanjali Diwara Nayakata Santi Dasata Raja Kajatika Dese Dudama Anuka Vimampaja Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samputasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samputasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samputasa Putang Dhammang Sankhang Namasa So First of all, I need to show you a raccoon. Bita, where's the picture? All right, there they are. That's three raccoons and they were under my bird feeder. They're about the size of an Australian possum or a very, very big fat cat little bandits they they have little masks on because they're bank robbers i think aren't they Are they okay thank you so these little guys were under my bird feeder for about two hours today very cute so what else um it's quite it's getting cold. It was minus three at Maikuti this morning. So we're getting the, the first frosts. And it's, uh, we're, all our buildings are very warm, so it's not a problem. And it's actually quite beautiful, the first frost. And the leaves are all gone now. The light in autumn is, is refracted in a particularly beautiful way. So it's a nice time of year. And uh, lots of changes. We had we had a nice, a small katina ceremony with the Thai ambassador and his staff. Ambassador Kalyana, lovely man. They're very very good friends, very good supporters. That was nice. But we had a very like many monasteries. We had a small katina, and then we received the katina gifts that Bita sent from everyone, so Anamotana, thank you. Thank you for your kindness. And uh, so I will be going to Thailand in a couple of, two or three weeks time. So that's my first journey away from the monastery now. This is the longest I've ever spent at a monastery in a continual period, I think for many years. Uh, so we have a retreat organized in near Pak Chong, uh, Yongpeng, and then I'll be back here. So all is well with us. Oh, another one of our monks, Venerable Sirimedo, is he's in charge of the building project. He's a very diligent monk, and so we offered him a, a period in Thailand because we'll be starting our... Um, Sala project in April or May, and he's our liaison with the architect and builder. He's got a lot of work, so we thought let him do a long retreat. And Ajahn Jayasaro has invited him to practice at his place. So he's, are you excited? 
He is excited in a good way. <laughs> but we're very happy for him because he's, he's very diligent and he likes formal practice, but he's willing to give himself to this project. So we're doing well. Um, Peter, did anyone ask for the topic? <laughs> Nothing. No? You guys got any topics? Anyone? No? No topics? All right, I'll just see what, what comes. <laughs> um, so I've been, I've been, I decided I wanted to learn tapestry weaving for some weird reason. Um, so I have a tapestry loom now. And I did, I did weed, weaving about 20 years ago with shuttle um, four shaft. It's a four shaft. I like, I like to work with my fingers. So this is different than woodwork. It's a bit more, more gentle. Um, but what's interesting is, is the, uh, what I, what I was thinking of is the, the famous book by Shunru Suzuki, uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. That was a very famous book in the 60s. And it's probably been republished multiple times. So that idea of beginner's mind, it's, it's, a, it's a very helpful attitude to bring to life in general and, and especially to meditation. So say I'm finding now, although I, did some weaving. I'm not really good at it. And I never, I was never, I was never taught formally. I just took it from books. And and so now I'm getting stuff from the internet. Uh, it's very interesting, but also that 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 beginner's mind allows me to make mistakes. So I'm like I tried to uh, put up some warp, and it was a disaster. And I threw all the warp yarn, and not all of it, some mass of the warp yarn. But since I'm considering, I've never, I really haven't done tapestry weaving and so on. My mindset is one, I will make mistakes. And, but that's the only way I'm going to learn by making mistakes and trying. Uh, and, and that attitude, you, you can apply that to anything. If I think I'm an expert, um, then it's quite often I'm not really aware of the way things are. I'm not really aware of what's going on. So like with this weaving, just watching myself, like I was trying to put on the warp. The warp is the, the kind of canvas of a, of a rug. So in this case, it's the vertical strings on a tapestry. But I'm sure you need to know this, but... <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to put it up and then how do I do this? How do I do this? And I keep looking and watching and trying and all of a sudden I'm doing it better than I was doing it before. And, and that's just the natural process of learning, isn't it? If we are willing to learn and, and in, in, many ways, in many ways, Buddhism is an education, isn't it? Uh, and we're not getting a PhD, we're getting the end of suffering, hopefully. That's the whole idea. And applying your mind in that way requires a kind of freshness of beginner's mind. So when you when you start meditation, if you already have an idea of what you want to achieve because you achieved it yesterday, or you have a technique which someone told you and you're just trying to apply the technique in a very unintelligent way, you're just doing it because your teacher told you, then you might not even notice what's going on. Or if you already have an opinion that, you know, you shouldn't be angry or you should be more kind, you have a lot of shoulds and shouldn'ts around and you're approaching the present moment from that attitude, that, that's not going to be very helpful because it's not an informed attitude. It's a biased attitude. It's a uh, idealized attitude. Uh, it's a it's an attitude which is coming from some memory the the moment we have is never a memory uh, so the, and classically you know how it goes where you have a 
good meditation and then you try to repeat the good meditation and you fail because you're not really aware you have experience and then you try to get repeat that experience but you don't look at this experience so the beginner's mind is something that um if you can especially like the 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 problems of the heart that we suffer from, our anxieties and fears and our held resentments and our, our personal histories of hurt and pain. We don't have that. Our sorrows and griefs and, and, and these are these are natural phenomena. And and the awakening to life is the kind of open acceptance of that, from which you can certainly do things. And usually that's around thought, isn't it? But if, I, if I'm not willing to be a beginner with my own fear at any given moment, or my own aversions or resentments, if I'm not willing to say, well, this is what's happening now, what's it really like, and not willing to learn from it, then probably I'm trying to get rid of something, or I'm trying to become something, and that will never, never work. So the whole point of Buddhism, I think, is, is that your, your emphasis is more on the knowing rather than the objective experience. And that's hard to get. The objective experience is some because we like pleasure. And I, I do hope my, my little rugs turn out well. And uh, I like health. And I like good weather. Well, that's, that's pretty natural. It's not wrong to like those things but we realize very very quickly that liking and preference is actually if it's not known it's a disaster because preference if it's not understood becomes an attachment or becomes a conceit or becomes whatever so without denying preferences what we like and what we feel comfortable with well notice that awareness is not a preference when i when i'm aware that i like the particular taste of some food, or I don't like the, just, but the particular taste of the food, awareness isn't a preference. The, the sense desire prefers, my habits prefer, uh, but awareness isn't the preference, awareness knows. So if you, if you already have a bias about what you want to get in meditation or get rid of, then of course it won't work because whatever arises is natural. And, and, and so like, let's say like I've been at this game for a while, and so I feel pretty good inside. And, and I often contemplate, well, what is it? What, why do I feel at peace? I mean, not, I'm not in light. It's not like that. It's just kind of really nice to be in the space I'm in right now. Um, but, but what, you know, what is it that, 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 is, that, that is peaceful in the end? Well, the emotions aren't peaceful, right? The emotions swing a lot and they're natural, uh, but they're not really peaceful because they're moving. They're always shifting. Fear is not peaceful, that's for sure. Um, but if I try to substitute fear with non-fear of some sort, or I just distract away from fear and anxiety into something else because I want some other experience, then that won't be peaceful either doesn't lead to peace. No, no condition is peaceful. No experience is peaceful. That doesn't mean it's not nice or beautiful or, 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 or fulfilling in the moment or exciting. That's all valid, that's all valid. But our aspiration in, in I think the highest sense of our aspiration in Buddhist practice is not that kind of sense happiness. I'll take it if it comes. You know, I'm not saying I'm gonna lie on a bed of nails or torture myself. I don't need to do that. But my, my, my goal is not happiness, which doesn't mean that I roll in the snow and, and beat myself up. It's not that. I enjoy goodness like anyone else. I enjoy good company and, and, and food which is nourishing. Sure, I enjoy that. But is enjoyment itself or spiritual quality Enjoyment is, you might say, quite often it's the good karma we have. I can, I can enjoy the company of friends because I've made friends. 
That's the good karma of that. But peace is something which is, um, it's not a function of, of, of experience. It's the knowing of experience. And where, that is, where that's really difficult to understand is negative experience. Because negative experience does not feel peaceful. When you feel um, resentful about something of some hurt you had, or, or you're really anxious about your kids, or um, you're worried about your mortgage or, or work, those are not pleasant feelings. They're not peaceful feelings. So you'd think, well, if I could get rid of them and do something about them, then I'd feel peaceful. Yeah, sure. You try to do things, get a job, and make sure you have food on the table. That's important, very important. But where peace really lies is the ability to, to bear witness to the whole, the whole thing, you know, the whole... William, William in Singapore, will you please stop poking the... William, you're really distracting me. You got, okay, thank you. Stop. William's on the second screen here, so. Uh, yeah, I see you, William. Anyway, so that experience just now was, was irritating for me, okay? Now, I love William and Karina, but I do wish they'd sit still. <laughs> You know, and that's human, isn't it? I know them. I've stayed with them. They're good friends. They won't take offense, I hope. They'll invite me someday again. And that's just the human experience, right? They need to change and, and will you stop doing that or whatever? Uh, and I can be aware of that, right? I can feel bad about that. Oh, I should be a really cool monk whose mind is always like ice or something like that. But I don't know, emotion, I have emotions, that's just what I am. But I'm not emotions, actually. Emotions are just a part of the, the, the kind of karma that I experience as a human being. Uh, so if I, if I take refuge in a particular kind of emotion, like an old mom, I should be this, I should be that, I should always be this and I should be that, that that's gonna really make me suffer. If I just follow my moods, and, and uh, you know, just be grumpy all the time or whatever mood comes up. Well, that's not it either. So we can know moods. We can engage life with moods or not. We can practice restraint, practice right speech. We can say things directly or not. But through it all, our, 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 our highest, uh, our refuge, our refuge is peace and peace is awareness of emotions as objects that come and go. Good, bad, or indifferent. So negative emotions are very hard to be at peace with because they're not peaceful. And if we think that peace is, is like a quality, a quality of emotion, hmm, you're gonna be in trouble. Now certainly, like for me, um, the amount of anxieties or fears I feel now is, is, is hugely small compared to who compared to 40 years ago it's huge the difference so there's that kind of peace and that is significant that the cessation of um anxieties and fears and resentments and angers but how does that come about how does this the kind of how does the volume of fear get turned down in in my consciousness how does the a rising of fear or anger and all these things, how does it not arise in the future? How has it less volume and less power in my life? Well, by me being able to witness to it when it comes up as an object, anicca dukkanatta. When I do that, and I just know fear feels this way, anger feels this way, and I, and I witness it, then that's the beginning of peace in the sense of things ceasing, things ending. And what that does is actually emphasizes how peaceful awareness is already. So there's sort of two aspects to peace. There's the peace of our karmic habits lessening, falling away, because we no longer believe in them. We no longer add to them. 
we we practice right speech and, and right livelihood and so on. We don't feed them. So for me, not feeding fear, not doing things which are dishonest or whatever, and, and facing up to my fears and being responsible means that fear um, has no nutrition and so fear dies away. That's peaceful, but it's not getting rid of it. And that's where, that's why we, when we say this takes a lot of patience, this work of, of, of watching the negativities of mind takes, takes a lot of uh, aditan and determination, a lot of honesty, um, willingness to, to endure the seeming undurable at time, uh, unendurable at times. Um, I was talking to a friend whose uh, husband just died. And I was talking uh, about my, when my mother died because we had, myself and this lady had similar experiences of caring for someone we loved for many years. And, and my, the, when my mom died, the, I had three months of total confusion. It was really weird. I didn't know, I didn't, it was a kind of emotional frameworks that I'd had kind of experienced before. And you, you know, it made sense that you do something intensely for eight years and then all of a sudden that's gone. There's going to be some kind of a result. And um, that lasted three, three months or so, and then it lifted. Now, was that right or wrong? It was, it was nature. It was just the nature of, of me caring for someone and the way I care for people. And then this was the result. So it didn't feel peaceful. It felt pretty awful, actually. <laughs> but, but, but my training as a monk is always, well, this is nature. Nature sometimes feels awful. And the knowing of that is peace. But it, peace doesn't have, it's not an emotional quality. As, as we, and, and, and so, I don't know about you, but my early years were just processing a lot of, a lot of rage and, and anger and lust. And, you know, not, I wouldn't want anyone to read my mind when I was a young monk. In fact, I often thought, oh gosh, if Lopo Cha sees what I'm thinking now, I'm in trouble. But fortunately, I don't know if he did. I think he understood young monks are that way. So now as an old man and an old monk, I can say that it does work. At the time, I wasn't sure, but I had faith. I had faith in Buddha, Mopacha, and because they seemed to have achieved something, I thought, okay, I'll trust them. And that's what we can do for each other when someone is just going around the bend with difficulties. So my, my friend is, you know, she's feeling the same kinds of things I felt. Oh, when my mom died. So I could reassure her. I said, yeah, I went through that. Yeah, it was really confusing. And uh, I didn't even know how to explain it. Here I am, I'm a monk of many years and people say, how are you? And I say, leave me alone. <laughs> it's not in your business. I don't want to explain. I couldn't explain because it was kind of really confused. And, and that's okay too. Then that's the thing about awareness. It's not, it's not an explanation. It's not a demand that you even understand the confusion you feel or don't feel, right? It's not that. It's not an intellectual analysis. It's just the way it is. Um, so Lopo Chas, Lopo Sumedo's constant emphasis, and Lopo Chas too, that, you know, it's just the way it is. So like say, if I think about those three months after my mom died, I know some of the other monks who got really confused because I'm usually, you know, fairly jolly guy, Uncle V kind of chap. And uh, I wasn't, you know, I was grumpy. And if anyone came to me, I said, leave me alone, go away. It's, <laughs> and socially it wasn't um, very graceful, but everyone understood, yeah, this guy's going through something. It's not easy. And everyone gave me the space to do that. And that's important for people who are, you know, who are grieving or going through some difficulty. You, you don't have to cheer them up. You can check in on them. Are you going nuts? <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> have you eaten? Uh, would you like a cup of tea? And you can check in on them and help them. But quite often, I don't know 
you know, some people like to talk things through, but I know for myself, if they, the, the difficulties I've had, just being quiet and observing in a kind of beginner's mind, looking, what's this really feel like to feel awful? Or what does it really feel like to feel anxious? What's that really like? It's a kind of education around these, these difficult states of mind. And that's the attitude we need of the beginner's mind. I've never experienced this before. Wow, what's this really like? And that kind of privacy can confuse others, especially if you're more um, outgoing, if you're gregarious. If you're always quiet, it's easier. But if you're gregarious and all of a sudden you're not, people, people try to change your mood for you. Oh, cheer up. And then maybe you feel guilty. You should cheer up. But then you never look at your heart. And, and, and it's quite important that if you feel some negativity to allow it to really blossom in full consciousness. Now that's different than just indulging in something. And the, and, and the secret of non-indulgence is monitoring the thinking process. So say that experience after mom died, I, I, I knew enough of my mind that I just didn't go to thought. And I just felt the mood and the, and, and the body and the mood and the body. And it, was, it was large and unpleasant. But that's all right. And then it finally went its own way. And, and then the mind was bright again. I didn't know how long it would last. And how should, you know, how, who can know? So, other, so I, I remember helping a, a, a friend in New Zealand who's, I've talked about this often, but her husband died of a aneurysm. He was quite young and they had teenage children. And he was basically gone within 24 hours. Totally, totally unexpected. She's a young mother. She's got three kids. Um, totally unexpected. And, and we became very good friends. And I would, I would visit her in Auckland. I was in Wellington, but I, because I was teaching in Auckland. And I sit down with her and she'd tell me the same story again and again and again. And that's what she had to do. She had just she had to just express this. And then eventually it it see it lasted a long time, the need to talk in that way. Now other other Buddhists said to her, well you should let go, which made me really annoyed because what does letting go mean? Does the letting go mean you don't feel? Uh, you should get on with it. Or, or get another husband or things like that. What business is it of theirs? And it was, you could see how, how unkind Buddhists could be and by just laying a trip on them. Oh, you're attached. Well, what does attachment mean? So you don't know. You don't know how long these things will last. But you, you can see the difference between like indulging in an emotion is just thinking about it all the time and, and feeling sorry for yourself. So there's a lot of I thinking, my thinking, which is okay, but you, you, you kind of wake up to it, don't you? And, oh, well, that's just thought. Oh, what's this mood really like? What's this like? What's this like? What's this like? And the mind goes off into thinking, yeah, but what's it like? That's a very important training, very important training, because that can deal with everything. So you've probably heard my mom dream, but I've got to put some humor into this. Uh, so this was... Three months after mom died, I was at uh, a bike area and I had this fabulous dream. Um, and when, when my mom was uh, in her condo and I was with her, I created a, a, a garden of potted flowers uh, on her terrace. She's on her fourth floor. And my record was, I think, like 65 potted plants, and, which was like, yeah, I've never done gardening, right? So I didn't know what I was doing, but it was it was very cool. And I had and I had little uh, we had uh, little cherry tomatoes and capsicums and things like that. It was most fabulous kind of environment. And I made her ramps to get her wheelchair. She could walk, but she couldn't make the step over into the terrace. I made a ramp. I got her over, and then she would sit in the in that in that floral environment maybe only like half an hour a day, if that. But it just so, gave her so much joy. And I had the insight that beauty, beauty is mudita 
And beauty for her was very important because it carried her through several days. She would just feel the beauty of that uh, environment because she loved gardening. She had had a garden for many, many years. So that was an interesting insight on beauty. But anyway, so that was the garden. So there were flowers and there were capsicums, and tomatoes. And stuff. So in the dream, this is at the Bhagiri, um, I'm in some building and a coffin comes in with six pallbearers and mom's one of the pallbearers and the coffin is covered in this elegant blue cloth and my mom was very very elegant lady and so the blue was her but yet she's carrying the coffin yeah and i see her and i'm just so happy oh mom, where you been I was just so happy. Then all of a sudden, the coffin is now gone, and I'm in an upstairs room, and Mom's dying. I was still happy to see her. It's not sad at all. And uh, she calls me over. She's speaking very, very softly. And she says to me very softly, don't forget to take care of the tomatoes. <laughs> it was just the greatest dream. And I was so happy. I was just so happy. And that was it. I knew mom was all right. I was all right. And that three month period ended. It was, it was very interesting, kind of finished. Very, very interesting. Um, I don't know how these things work, but I think the fact that I, that I just honored <laughs> the emotion that came through because I have the experience of being with the way things are. And you can see how previous practice gives you the tools to deal with more extreme things. This is, the, this is why we say the practice clicks in. That's the language we use, don't we? And um, then I kind of understood it. I understood what had happened. Then I could talk about it, teach about it, so on. But at the time, I couldn't teach. And I didn't want to. I just had to be with that. And fortunately, and our sanghas are always very compassionate about those things. So when you're, you know, when you're, when you're with your loved ones, or if your loved ones pass away, these, these areas of grief and sorrow, they're not bad. You know, it's not bad for someone to feel sorrow um, and grieving. I mean, it's a good thing, isn't it? It's the most natural thing. And, and you don't know how long it'll last. It's not like, you know, it's going to last two and a half weeks. It's some kind of Buddhist formula. One person lasts a long time. Ajahn Chah, probably not at all. I don't know. Like when his mom died, I don't know what Ajahn Chah felt. Um, never asked him. Would have been interesting. I wasn't old enough. I didn't know any time. But what Ajahn Chah did is he then built uh, this uh, huge ordination hall where he, uh, on his mother's uh, funeral pyre. What a tribute, it was a fabulous tribute. This, there's a post at the hall, those of you who've seen it, it's kind of wing thing. That's on the, the space that he uh, created the funeral pyre for his mom. So there's a tribute. And we do have these traditions, don't we, in, in, in Buddhism. Um, and I think they're much stronger in, in Asian cultures of, of venerating our, our parents and, and our, our loved ones in these, in these beautiful ways. But loss is loss, isn't it? Whether uh, loss is a very important thing to, to, to understand because when you can be with loss or, or, or a lack and you can, it's okay, you go beyond desire. If you can't be with loss, then you're always seeking some kind of substitute or, or gratification or compensation to get away from the loss. But when you feel it fully face, yeah, life is like that. There is death, there is loss. Um, it's not wrong. It can be tragic, sure, for this woman in New Zealand. It was tragic because it was at such a, an early age and she had to really fend for herself. My mom's death was really quite beautiful in that sense that she had a full life and I had a lot of time with her. But life you know, still hurts. <laughs> You can't say to someone, oh, she was old. 
get over it. No, you feel what you feel. And so, so compassion is this, this, this allowing ourselves to feel loss. Um, and, 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 and going back to that idea of beginner's mind, if you always can come back to, well, what's it really feel like this sense of loss, say? That's the beginner's mind. And you do that every day. What's it really feel like? Because it can be tiresome and, and you think you're doing something wrong. You're not doing anything wrong. You're just experiencing life as it is. And the more we do that, then all, all loss takes us to silence. All gain takes us to silence because silence is the knowing. Success or failure, these kind of worldly dharmas. All right, I'll leave that for your reflection. Thank you, Lom Po. Andamayang o Vadagata Sadu Karangadamase Sadu Anumoda. Thank you, Lampo. And Lampo, would you have time for a few uh, questions and answers? Certainly, yes. Thank you. So, brothers and sisters, I'd like to welcome you to join Lampo and uh, Q and A. Please feel free to click on the raise hand button, and uh, we'll invite you to unmute. Maybe William wants to be unmuted. He's pressing. William, you want to say something to Lampo? <laughs> How are you? How are you? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Lompo, I understand you're coming to Thailand. Are you traveling yes. anywhere besides Thailand? No. Next question. <laughs> no, it's all, it's, it's all kind of rushed. And, and uh, I only have a three week window. So. Since since you you know we canceled Singapore and we're doing the Zoom thing, Thailand. We thought we were going to do a Zoom retreat with Thailand as well, but then all of a sudden Thailand changed its quarantine uh, situation. So I only have to quarantine, assuming I don't have COVID when I get there. I only have to quarantine for one day, and so it, it may it kind of facilitated. It's all changed in in a week. So it's fixed. I'm, I'm sorry. Are the dates fixed? They are. We've changed the tickets four times. <laughs> I'm a serious uh, aged 60 years and changing all the tickets. Let us have the dates, Lumpo. Maybe we'll try to All the dates um, for the retreat. Yes. Um, the retreat is from the 3rd to the 10th. 3rd to the 10th of December. 3rd to the 10th of December. Okay. December. Okay. Okay. I shouldn't have said this <laughs> for your Thank you. William, you have to come to me first. Yes, I will def definitely make an effort next year, Long Hong. I think you should okay. try next year. Next year, okay. and, and, quite early. And we have the Singapore uh, New Year's retreat, don't we? No, Budamas. We do Budamas. Yes, yes, yes. Everyone know what Budamas is? Christmas. Ajahn Chah, when we were with Ajahn Chah, we told him what he didn't know what Christmas was. So we explained Christmas. He said, oh, that sounds good. Let's do Budamas. So we used to do Budamas every year. Okay, William, Karina, nice to see you. Thank you. Anyone has a question for Long Paul? Karen. Karen, I think you have a pressing question. Hi, Karen. Hi, Long Paul. Sorry. I'm a bit dark here. Sorry. No, I thought your, your presentation was absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, I think a lot of us have been going through very difficult times. And, um, you know, it's, it's quite interesting because 
you know, we know people who have had loss and I myself basically have gone, just gone through surgery with my mother. And it's been really trying because you go like, I'm supposed to be calm and I'm supposed to be calm, <laughs> and I'm supposed to be a good Buddhist, but, you know, I feel like crap. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, so and, I, and maybe you're supposed to feel like crap. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's your mother and it's, 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 it's makes you anxious. And so maybe the emotions are supposed to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I thought the fact that you, 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 it was so impromptu today. It was wonderful that you did what you did today. And I thought that was really great because it was honoring loss because yeah. sometimes we brush aside and, you know, we, we brush under the carpet, a lot of things that we think that we shouldn't be feeling. And yeah. sometimes it just does more damage than it than we think it does. It just comes sure. in its head after. And I think that that part of it to honor, and you said to spend as much time and nobody knows how long it takes. <laughs> I, f- I find you, the fact that you told people to just leave me alone, very, very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Some people feel better if they talk things through. I feel better if I'm left alone. And, yeah, and me too. <laughs> yeah, you too, huh? If you really want to get me, if I if I have a sour face and any monk comes and says, How are you? They're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm leave me alone. <laughs> so they've learned to hope that when the abbot has a sour face, don't go near him, he's radioactive. <laughs> And maybe, maybe that's we make that's why we make sour faces, so that people know we are radioactive. And and the the thing is, I think what happens is that other people feel insecure, right? Yeah. And it's their problem, their insecurity. Oh, what have I done? Or how can I fix this? But you know, uh, that means they're not looking at their own sense of insecurity. Now, it can be loving. It can be very, very loving and caring, but it can be overly protective too. So with adults, I think don't, yeah, don't force a person to be happy if it's not the time to be happy. Don't force them to to be jolly when it's not time to be jolly. Having said that, if someone's just a real boring, uh, cynical, grumpy habit well then throw some water on them or something <laughs> you know so there there is a place where people just are habitually negative and complaining that's different but here we're talking about emotions aren't and and the strength of that yeah good okay i'm glad it was helpful Lumpur, i've got another question um one of the things that you mentioned during this talk that was that really clicked with me was um, at some point, instead of feeling what you felt, you also had an informed response to your practice. And I thought that was very important because sometimes we, we do a lot of rudimentary things that we are told to do, and then we kind of lose sight of why we're doing it. And I think, it, and, and the fact that you saw the process and how, it, how, how that clicked, you know, the why started to click with the how. Um, can you elaborate more on that? Because I thought that was really, really helpful. Well, I think the problem is we overanalyze. And then that over, uh, over-dependence on analysis and thought is actually trying to get rid of what's going on. Because actually what's going on is not a problem. It's just unpleasant. So when it's, when it's unpleasant and, 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 and somewhat foreign or, or intense, we think, well, that's a problem. I shouldn't feel this intense aversion towards someone. It's not really a problem. It's a problem if you hit them in the face. Yeah, that becomes a problem. <laughs> so don't, you know, don't do that. Or you, use, you write a stupid email, that'll be problematic too. But, but the intensity of emotion is not really a problem. It's just a vipaka kamma. So our, our analytical minds are forever trying to fix it because we don't want it. And that whole teaching around Vibhava Tanha, the, 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 
the uh, resistance to things, the not wanting of things is terribly important, especially around these things. So if you use mantras like, what do I want that I don't have? What do I have that I don't want? And you, you raise those up into the mind, you see that the problem isn't the intensity of emotion, it's the, the wanting. And the, all the analysis that spins out from that, of, you know, what have I done wrong, or I shouldn't be like this, or they shouldn't have done that to me. And that is, of course, invested with a strong sense of I, you know, I thinking, my thinking, ego. And when you, when you have a lot of thinking, which has a lot of I in it, you know, that's Mara. That's just delusion. Don't believe a word of it. Whereas, whereas can I like factual thinking? I feel, you know, this is a really difficult feeling. That's a good thought. Or, wow, this is very strong. That's a good thought. As opposed to, what am I going to do? It's so strong. What should, and I shouldn't be this way and that. Culturally too, you're, you're required to be a certain type of woman in your society at your age, right? So you have all these cultural expectations put upon you. I, I get that as a senior mom, right? You know, I should always be whatever people think I should be. And then I really like disappointing them sometimes. <laughs> it's quite delightful. <laughs> and <laughs> so you can get trapped. Like, like a lot of, I, I think a lot of senior monks, when we start teaching, we get trapped into these identities of being a Kuba Ajahn. You know, that, you know, you're like really ascetic or that you you can stand on your head for four hours or or that you only sleep two and a half hours and, 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 you, and, and you don't like ice cream or, you know, whatever, whatever nonsense you have um, about what you should be from models of behavior of beings you've never met. So there's a kind of for us, the idealized uh, culture is like a, a, an Ajahn Man figure very ascetic, very, you know, that kind of thing. And then the poor monk tries to be Ajahn Man, which is a hopeless disaster. You know, he's a Western monk. He hasn't got the cultural context. He hasn't got the bar of me. Ajahn, like we don't, you know, all the Western monks, we're trying to get enlightened overnight, fiercely meditating. He said, you guys, you're trying to be the Buddha. I mean, you, you can barely sit, sit still. What are you doing? Relax. <laughs> It's going to take you a long time. So the cultural kind of formats that I kind of was intimidated by were really strong agrarian monks who were much more strong than me, had much more endurance than me. Uh, and then texts which said that I should love all sentient beings all the time, 24-7. Uh, and things like that. And, uh, and so, or, or, or I'd be very intimidated by a monk who was more competent than me, you know, who could meditate better than me or, or, or who could learn a patimoka better than me or things like that, comparison and judgment. But that was just my ego mind thinking and, and the culture put it on me. I know with Lompo Semedo, he, he tried to, to sort of, copy Ajahn Chah in the first year of Wadana Chah. And then he realized, I'm not Ajahn Chah. I have to do it my own way, which is really liberating for him, I think. But so that's the kind of cultural uh, attachments which I was dealing with, you'll have your own. And sometimes they're so pervasive, you don't even see them because everyone assumes that's correct. This is what a woman should be. This is what a mother should be. Uh, like, like I imagine if you're a mother and, and you find your child obnoxious, that must be very difficult. <laughs> but I cannot see how it would not happen. Surely, you, you, most mothers would find their kids obnoxious sometimes? I don't know. Could, do you always find your children attractive? Seems to me impossible. I don't, I've never had children. You'd love them, right? But, but maybe you found them obnoxious. And then you'd think, oh, I should not find them obnoxious. But it's not, you're not going to act on it. You just know oh, this is what aversion to my child feels like. It's fine. You don't hurt them. You feed them. You take care of them. But actually, maybe they deserve your, 
you know, the, what's your feeling? So kind of to really be honest about your feelings, but then honor what is right. What is right is, is compassionate action. Uh, what is right is generous action. What is right is moral action, doing the best you can for your kids and so on. But, but being, you know, being honest with what you feel. Um, and then it can't hurt you. It can't really hurt you at all. We th I, I, I guess we, 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 we think that if we don't somehow get rid of these things, they're going to control us and they're going to poison us, but they're not. Once they're up in consciousness and they're object in awareness, they can't hurt you. It's when they're subconscious, when they're the shadow, the unseen shadow, that's when it gets really dangerous. That's the bad part. So Lumpur Sameda's constant suggestion, consciousness is the escape path. Let things become conscious. That was so helpful, that, that teaching. And then when, like, so if we go back to the feelings I had when my mom died, I let it be conscious, but I didn't know what it was. I just knew it was uncomfortable. I didn't know how long it lasted. But that's where, that's where faith comes in, trust. What do you trust in? The analytical mind, trying to figure it all out, trying to get rid of it, or just trust in body awareness, trust in, oh, this feels, this feels difficult. This feels really difficult. Then, then you're okay because you, you're taking refuge in awareness. Thank you, Longpo. That was really helpful. Thank you for your question. That was really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, anyone? All right. All right, Lampo. There are no more questions. Cash in our chips. <laughs> yes, we can cash in our chips now and reflect. Do the Metta Sutta? Yes, we can do that. So please join. Forte, fortissimo. <clears throat> this is what should be done by who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech. Humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, or knitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with the boundless heart should one cherish all living radiating kindness over the entire world, Spreading upwards to the sky and upwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed <clears throat> from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, 
One should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to the excuse, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, <clears throat> being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank all you. right, everyone. Be well. Thank you. See you on the 18th, is it? No. Yes. 19th. 19th. 19. And just okay. take note that uh, there will be a time change. Um, yes. Yes. So uh, with those living in Singapore and Malaysia, the next session will start at 8 a.m. Uh, as uh, Toronto goes into uh, daylight savings. Right. Ah, okay. Right, right. Good thinking. Okay. Okay. Ciao. Be Thank well. You, Paul. Yes. We all pay our respects to you before we leave. Oh, please do. Okay. Let's bow three times together. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Okay. Thank you, Long Paul. Oh, the Hadanta, how is your grandchild? I thought I thought she wrote to me. Okay. Bye bye. See you.